and uh, it's hard to believe it's only a few more days before Christmas. As we start, we want to sing Joy to the World. Let's stand with us as we sing. things were created. Who does this glory belong to? The Word is Jesus, God the Son, the second perfect person of the Trinity. And just like God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, He has always existed. Before He had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world, He was there. And yet today, we celebrate His birth. It's a beautiful image, the manger. Something so small, so temporary, used to feed creatures, should house the infinite creator. The manger deserves our attention. It demands that we glorify and praise God, just like the shepherds seeking the proclaimed savior 2,000 years ago. Have we rushed too quickly past this miraculous wonder that God would choose to be formed inside Mary's womb, cells multiplying into a nose, a neck, kidneys, toenails. Have our hearts grown accustomed to the hymnal's words, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Who is this word that stepped out of eternity and into a manger. He is the exact image of God, and in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He is the supreme creator. In wisdom, he has made them all. The earth is full of his creatures. He is unchanging, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
He is infinite and self-existing and all-knowing. He is the second person of the Trinity, willing to join his divinity with humanity. He is the righteous judge, appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. He is unlimited, able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think. He is the King of Kings, whose throne is established with justice and righteousness. He is the fullness of God express. He is the Lion of Judah, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He is the mighty God. He is everlasting Father. He is Emmanuel, God with us. As we continue in worship this morning, I ask that you would keep your minds and your hearts focused on God. I want to just read you a portion of scripture from Psalm chapter 16, uh, verses that spoke to me uh, powerfully this week is just the, the emotions, the decisions, the many things that are going through our minds right now as we are coming upon Christmas in the midst of a pandemic and uncertain in the times. Listen to these words that the psalmist cries out to God. He says, keep me safe. O oh God, for I have come to you for refuge. God is our refuge this morning. The psalmist says, I said to the Lord, you are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. Do we remember this morning where all of our good and perfect gifts come from? The godly people in the land, they are my true heroes. I take pleasure in them. Troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. I will not take part in their sacrifices of blood or even speak the names of their gods. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. Let me read those words again. The Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken. He is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forevermore. Well, good morning, church family. So glad that you're here and so glad that you have come to worship our great and amazing God together and, and a welcome to all those who are watching online as well. Merry Christmas. I know it doesn't feel as Christmassy as last week per se, but it's all good. We are looking forward to having time after service together uh, in the cafe. Uh, there's just some, some guidelines, so just make sure that you, you follow that as you're going through there, and, and we're looking forward to a time of fellowship together. Uh, there will be children and youth Sunday school this morning, and we're very much looking forward to that. And uh, if you're coming and joining us this week on Christmas Eve, uh, our first service is actually full. The 6 p.m. filled up uh, the same day, that registration opened, and so we're praising God for that. Uh, there's still about 20 spots left in our second service at 8 p.m., uh, so please feel free to join us or welcome, invite other people to come along with us. Well, our focus in Advent this morning is on peace. And so I'm going to invite at this time the Kinsman family to come on up. And they're going to read and pray and light the peace candle and lead our, our focus onto Christ at this time. Thank you very much. For the final week in Advent, we focus on peace. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Picture a man named Abraham. He was 75 years old and married to Sarah, who was also well along in years. 
They had been married for a lifetime, yet they had no children. God came to Abraham in his old age and said, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Let's be clear. God was asking a lot of Abraham. Leave everything you know and go to a place I will show you. Put your trust in me, and I will bring you to a place that will someday be known as Canaan. I will make you a great nation. You don't have any children yet, but trust me, you will. Yes, God asked a lot of Abraham, but God promised Abraham even more. He promised descendants, blessing, and protection on the journey. God asked a lot and promised a lot, and Abraham had faith. As he embarked on this journey, he put his trust in God, and God gave him peace. The peace that filled Abraham as he embarked on a very unknown, dangerous, and difficult journey is the same peace that God offers us today in the midst of our unknown, dangerous, and difficult journey. God asks a lot, but he promises so much more. What peace? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you now with thankful hearts, thankful that we can still gather together and worship and serve you, and most of all, thankful that you sent your son Jesus as a savior for our broken world. You have promised rest for the weary, peace for the anxious, and acceptance for the brokenhearted. Not just at Christmas, Lord, but every day of the year. You are our peace. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you are the Good Shepherd. Lord, we ask that you would lead us beside still waters in these uncertain times. Jesus, as we celebrate you at Christmas and always, uh, in your name we pray. Amen. As we continue in worship and singing this morning, stand with us again as we sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. We come and worship him and praise his name this morning. Thank you. 
Jardin family as they uh, continue to work through their grief and the passing of Richard's dad. We want to ask God during this uh, special time of year for grace and resilience and continued patience and the courage to proclaim the gospel and that God would grant us his peace. That's the theme for this Lord's Day uh, during our Advent season, peace. And it's a peace that only Christ can bring. We need to look to Him for it. We'll definitely not find it in our culture right now. (laughs) I guess you noticed. We need it from Him. And so let's ask God for that grace and strength and make it through this Christmas season. And you know, it's during times of difficulty and hardship like this when we're pressed on every side that God meets us. And uh, I've been amazed at the number of conversations I've been having with people who have been who've experienced the nearness and presence of Christ like never, ever before. Uh, It's in times like this that God meets us in a special way by His Holy Spirit. When we don't know where to turn and when we're stretched uh, and we're struggling, He becomes particularly real when we call out to Him. So this morning, let's call out to Him together in prayer and ask that by His grace, He would meet us. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're near to the brokenhearted, that you reveal to yourself yourself to those who are uh, a contrite heart. Father, those who sense their brokenness and sin and their need for you. And we thank you, Lord, that in the midst of this pandemic, you've been revealing yourself to us. You've been revealing our own idols those things that we run to for security, you've been exposing. 
uh, and helping us to realize, Lord, that they are they're false gods. They're cisterns that can hold no water. They're things that can bring no lasting security. And thank you, God, for exposing them for what they are through this pandemic. The way you used suffering and, and isolation and hardship to remind us that our only hope and our only security can be found in Jesus. Thank you, God, for the way you allowed hardship uh, to bring this good work to pass. And so, Father, we pray now that you would work in our lives a resilience that can only come by your Holy Spirit. Courage to proclaim your word. Thank you, God, that your word is not bound by these circumstances that we're in, but that it is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword to, to piercing our hearts and dividing us under joints and marrow and as a, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Thank you that your word will still do your work. Father, work in us patience to wait for this hardship that we're going through to accomplish its perfect work and to bring us and move us towards maturity and righteousness. And Father in heaven, we pray that you would grant us your peace. A peace that passes all understanding, all logic. Father, that we would know your peace and your presence here among us this morning. Father, we pray for those in our midst who are grieving, who are struggling, who are brokenhearted, struggling with loneliness and isolation. Father, you be their comfort, we pray. You sustain them during these times, Father. And help us as the body of Christ to come around them and, uh, and, and bring encouragement and encouragement to persevere and love and support into their lives. Father, we pray for many in our community, Lord, that are going to go through this Christmas alone and unknown struggling in private. Father, we pray that you would lead us to them. Lead us to them, God, uh, and give us the, the tenderness of heart to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us that discernment to follow where you lead, that we would find these people who are alone and isolated and that we would come near to them and provide comfort and encouragement to them. And your gospel truth. God, we leave this to you. Just give us responsive hearts when you create the opportunities for us. And Father, we pray especially for those in long-term care homes right now who are alone. Can't be with their families, Lord. We pray that you would be a comfort to them, especially in this season. We pray for many of the uh, caregivers in these homes, Lord, some who go to this church, Father. We pray that you would help them by your grace and sustain them by your grace and keep them healthy by your grace so that they can be a comfort to these folk. And Father, we pray your richest blessing on our nurses and caregivers right now. Lord, they are angels of mercy in these places, in the hospitals, among the the lonely and the isolated, Father, we pray your blessing on them and through them as they care for these folk. Father in heaven, thank you for this time now where we can worship uh, around your throne. Take our requests and our fears to you and trust them to you. Prepare our hearts to hear your word, to be encouraged by it, and grant us the grace to continue to persevere by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. One thing I want to remind you of before I sit down and then Brett takes over on the piano is that uh, I mentioned last week that we'd be going to one service on December 27th. 
That's just for December 27th. It's not going to be one service after that. Uh, so I wanted to clarify. Lori said to me, Tim, what have you done? I said, what? <laughs> it's a good thing, you know, God bless our staff, man. If it wasn't for them, I would be a walking train wreck, right? So, yeah, December 27th is only going to be for that particular day. And then after that, we're going to go back to our, our two services. And so, Brett, you can take over from here, brother. more than just staff to keep me straight. I also need my wife who said, Tim, you never said when the service was. Man, oh man, how many people do I need in my care committee to keep me online? That's at 10 o'clock in the morning on December 27th. Anything else that I missed? I should probably check. Dwight? Yeah, no, I'm okay. Good. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Did I say eight? Oh, man. What is going on? It's just, it just keeps getting worse. It's, it's rolling now. I don't know how to make it stop rolling. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Beginning to read at verse 8. Oy. I am supposed to be up here right now, aren't I? Just thought I better check. Luke chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that you would attune our hearts to hear and listen to your Spirit speaking to us. And Father, I pray you would keep me from saying anything that's not in keeping with your truth this morning, that Jesus would be magnified and exalted among us this morning in Christ's name. Amen. I think for the most of us here this morning, um, as, we, as we near the end of 2020, um, we kind of feel like, Hopefully, this is going to be the end to what seems like a bad dream, right? <laughs> I hope this is it, right? Maybe 2021 will bring something different, but we can't hope in that, can we? Our hope needs to be in Christ alone. But when you think of it, you know, between the, the fear and the uncertainty brought on by this pandemic, and then the whole idea, you know, of, you know, I make, I make the mistake of, of being on the news probably more than I ever should be, you know. But then, you know, you hear this idea of financial collapse. 
right, that's coming with this pandemic. And, and, and you know, the struggle that people are having just to keep their businesses open. And, and just the, the isolation of the quarantine and Zoom fatigue, which is a whole other animal. Public unrest and then division. Um, and then to top it all off, to put the icing on the cake, what, what seemed like the most weirdest election south of the border that I think we've ever witnessed. It was so strange. All that's come together to be this kind of a, a year that's reminded us again and again of how much stock we put in things around us to give us security, to give us a sense of peace and, and, and the, the idea that everything's going to be okay. We, we look to things outside of us and our circumstances to give us that sense of control. But instead, we have times like this that remind us that we're not in control and that in fact, deep down in our hearts, there's a lot of brokenness and there's a lot of disconnect from God. And, and more than ever, I think, at this time, this Christmas, we long for the light of love and joy and hope and peace. And you know, in, in many ways, this past year has prepared us for what one writer described as the ache of Advent. That longing for when things will be made right and will have true and lasting joy and peace with the coming of Messiah Jesus. Amy Grant uh, I think she, she put it best in, in her rendition of my grown-up Christmas list. Uh, you know, this is one of my favorite Christmas songs because just it, it, it puts into words the ache that I oftentimes feel at Christmas. No more lives torn apart. Then wars would never start. And time would heal all hearts. And everyone would have a friend and right would always win, and love would never end. This is my grown-up Christmas list. Advent is designed to stir up in our hearts a longing for a better world. Eugene Peterson once said, a person has to get fed up with the ways of the world before they can acquire an appetite for the world of grace. So true, isn't it? And you know, praise God, I think that's what that pande this pandemic has done in a way. It's made us fed up with the status quo. It's reminded us that there's a better world. And so this morning we come to the message of the angels, to the shepherds, with a deeper appreciation uh, for their herald, peace on earth, upon those whom his favor rests. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And, and, and Jesus spoke these words, right, when he was letting the disciples know that he wasn't going to be around for much longer. They were suddenly hit with the same kind of insecurity and fear that we feel, right? How are we going to make it without him? And on this fourth Sunday in Advent, I'd like us to meditate on the final theme of our Advent season, which is the peace that Messiah brings. And we all remember the story, right? There were shepherds uh, in the fields watching over their flocks by night. And the only reason I know that is because that's what Linus said, right? So pff, I think every kid memorized the Bible because, through Linus, you know? It became the best teacher. Um, and, and we've oftentimes heard over the years how shepherds were the social outcasts of their day. Any of you had a chance to watch The Chosen yet? Um, they put out a Christmas version of The Chosen, where it kind of summarized that whole Christmas uh, story and, and did it through the eyes of a, one particular shepherd. If you haven't watched it yet, just Google it, The Chosen Christmas, 
or you can watch, you can, uh, what do you call it, binge watch the whole eight episodes of The Chosen. If you haven't done it, you need to sit down with your family and do that this Christmas. You absolutely need to, because it's one of the most profound and moving uh, accounts of the Christmas story that you'll ever watch. Uh, it, it totally, it transformed the way I've seen Jesus and, and the Christmas story. And so please watch that if you get a chance. But here were these shepherds, they were the outcasts of their day, out in the fields near Bethlehem, watching over their flocks to protect them from predators at night. And all of a sudden, this, this bright, shining light shines around them. Uh, and at first, a, a lone angel appears with an announcement of good news, and they are freaked out and paralyzed with fear because most people who see angels in the Old Testament died. And the, but instead, this time around, the angels speak words of comfort to them, And then they make this announcement in verses 10 and 11. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And then we go on to read in verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And this is where I want to break out on the Messiah, but you don't want to hear it. And on his peace among those with whom he is pleased. And, and then the NIV, I think, has to those upon whom his favor rests. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that uh, translation uh, is that it's, it's drawn actually from, you know, the Greek text is drawn from the Old Testament where it implies that God chooses his people and, and his favor by grace rests upon those that he draws to himself. So the first thing that we want to look at this morning is this idea of this heavenly herald of peace. Here, the angels reveal through their praise the significance of Jesus' coming to earth to manifest the glory of God, to reveal what God is like. That's what it means to manifest His glory, to show us what He's like in the the whole, uh, you know, panoplia of God's attributes, and then to bring true and lasting peace to his people. And that part of the song is what I'd like to focus on this morning, this this declaration of peace. It's a, first of all, point A, a peace on earth. In Luke 2.14, the peace spoken of here is, is not necessarily a cessation of conflict, which, what, which is what we associate with peace, right? No more fighting. It finds its roots in the Old Testament Hebrew word for peace, which is shalom. It communicates the idea of a total peace for the whole person. Uh, The famous Stoic philosopher Epictetus, who, by the way, interestingly enough, was a contemporary of Luke. He would have been alive at the same time that Luke, the historian and doctor, was writing this gospel. Epictetus observed that while the emperor may give peace from war on land or at sea, he's unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy, and greed. He cannot give peace of heart, for which man yearns more for than even an outward peace from conflict. The peace spoken of here by the angels is first and foremost a peace in our relationship with God. Spoken of by the Apostle Paul when he writes in in Colossians 1, for in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in bodily form. And God was pleased to bring this fullness to completion. Sorry, I didn't get that right. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in your minds doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in the body of his flesh by death in order to present you holy and blameless and without reproach before him. The greatest peace, the peace that we really need in these times of turmoil 
is not political, it's not psychological, but it's spiritual. And that spiritual peace can't be found by looking within, which is common in our culture today, right? Uh, influenced as it is by Eastern mysticism, we're you know, encouraged, follow your heart. Look within to that divine self discovered through meditation or through drugs. That peace only comes through Jesus Christ. Scripture testifies to the fact that sin has separated us from the one who created us. And that alienation, that separation creates a hostility and an unrest in our souls. That restlessness is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he writes in Isaiah 57 verse 20, the wicked are like the tossing sea that casts up mire and dirt and mud. There is no peace, says my God, to the wicked. St. Augustine has famously written in his confessions, you've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. This soul rest that every human heart longs for can only be found through the cross work of Jesus Christ, whereby he reconciled us to God. He brought peace between two warring parties and made it possible for us to have a relationship with God. In Isaiah 53, 5, the prophet Isaiah looks forward in time to the coming of Messiah Jesus. And he writes, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Have you responded to that grace of God this morning? Christmas reminds us anew and afresh that God sent His Son to bear in His body the chastisement and the judgment that we deserved for our sin. And He did it by His death on the cross. By His wounds, you have been healed of the wickedness and hostility to God that brought you unrest. And, and you know, if you're a believer here this morning, And you're saying, oh, Pastor Tim, I've heard that a million times. Well, you need to hear it another million. Why? Because it's not designed to to bring you to faith in Christ. You're already there. But what's it designed to do? To give you gratitude, to remind you why you're here, and to make you thankful for it. And if you don't know Christ this morning, maybe you hear you think you're in because you're in church. (laughs) That's not sufficient, and I hope you know that. You need Christ. You need to have that relationship with Him whereby you can testify that you know your sins are forgiven and that you have assurance of heaven. You can be freed from the guilt of your sin and the self-condemnation that you often feel as a result of it. But... That peace is not something that just comes to you by showing up in a building or being brought up in a Christian family. That peace is a gift that has to be received by faith. And so John, the apostle, writes in John chapter 1, verse 12, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Secondly, The peace spoken of here by the angels is a peace that frees us from the anxieties of everyday life. Philippians 4, 7, 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts, and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's an unexplainable peace that descends upon the heart of a believer who lifts their fears and anxieties to God in prayer. 
when our lives have been brought back in relationship to God through faith in Christ, we have somewhere to take our fear. We can take it to the Prince of Peace. And then Scripture testifies to the fact someday there will be a comprehensive shalom peace that will be ushered into human history that will endure forever under the reign of Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. In that great prophecy in Isaiah of a coming Messiah, there's a, the prophecy of a king there who will rule the nations. And we've all heard it, right? We could probably say it by memory from, for now, you know. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of His government and peace, there'll be no end. Rembrandt uh, Van Ren did an etching of this moment when the shepherds were visited by the angels. And I think you remember seeing this from last year. I'm not so sure, sure. I can never keep track. But uh, I might have shared this etching with you last year. Does it look familiar? I don't know if it does or not. That was a year ago. A lot of water passed under the bridge since then. Uh, but interestingly enough, in this etching by Rembrandt of the visitation of the shepherds uh, by the angels, it has all the shepherds recoiling in fear and running away. But then Rembrandt does something really interesting uh, in this etching. And we'll, I, the next slide has a kind of a blow up uh, of it where you see the figure uh, uh, more closely of the one shepherd, he's not running. He's the only guy who's not running. And he's actually looking out at the people looking in. And it was oftentimes a pictorial device used by Rembrandt to cause the viewer to consider, how will you respond to the angel's message? Do you see the figure there? He's right in the middle uh, at the center up, up above. And he's looking out at the viewer. And Rembrandt would use this pictorial device over and over and over to say, what are you making of this? And, it, and so the question is thrown back at us. Do you have the peace proclaimed by the angels? Do you have peace with God? Are you at this moment experiencing the peace of God? You can't have one without the other. You must come to the place where you submit to Christ, repent of your sin, and receive Jesus' forgiveness as a gift by faith. And the peace of God will flood your heart and bring rest to your soul. That's the first and foremost response that Luke was looking for in his readers. But another response to these events is seen in what the shepherds did after seeing the child Jesus. In verse 17 and 20, we read, When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard as had been told them. So after seeing this Christ child, the shepherds instinctively told everyone they met and went back into the fields singing the doxology and proclaiming to everyone the glory of that moment. So the two of these go hand in hand. If you really believe the message of the carols that we were singing this morning, thank you, Jamie, for leading us in those. But if you really believe that, then you won't keep that wonderful message to yourself. Gospel is good news. Good news, any kind of news is meant to be shared, but especially good news. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation. You say, well, Pastor Tim, what do I tell people? If you're struggling to know what to say, then, you know, go back to the peanuts and remember what Linus said, right? Remember the, the testimony of these shepherds. What did they do? Do you think they went out and explained to everybody the theology of the gospel? 
they told everybody what they'd seen and heard, right? That's all you need to do. What have you seen and what have you heard? What has God done in your life and what have you heard about the gospel? Now, a lot of you folk here, you've been sitting in church for a long time. You've been getting the same message Christmas after Christmas. You ought to have it memorized by now, right? Why should it be so hard to tell what you've seen and heard, right? Tell what you've seen and heard. Go up to your Uncle Jim or your Aunt Mary and say to them, Jesus was born for you so that you can have peace, Uncle Jim, to save you from your sin. Will you receive that gift? Because it's free. See what kind of conversation that starts. Of course, it might end it. That's quite possible too, right? But you never know. You see, yeah, we say to ourselves, among our, and, and I've had this happen at, at work too, right? We say, well, you know, I've shared with Joe, Joe in the, you know, packing department for years. And he's never responded. Do it again. Because you never know what a year brings in an individual's heart and life to make them open to the gospel. And, you know, I could share story after story of people who shared with me how, you know, every year they would share the same story with their coworkers, and their coworkers would blow them off every year. And then one year, one person goes through a struggle that God uses to open up their hearts to the gospel, and that's the year that everything changed. That's why we have to persevere. We, we can't lose heart in doing good and in sharing the gospel. Why? Because you never know when it's God's time for that one person that you've been sharing with like 30 times to come to faith in Christ. We forget sometimes to share the good news because we forget how good it is, right? And so that's why we need to hear these stories over and over. That's why, you know, we come to the communion table every month. Why? Because we need to hear the gospel over and over to remember how good it is. Henry uh, Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a famous Christmas carol in 1863. He wrote it after losing his wife in a tragic fire right around Christmas time. And then around the same time, I think it was in that very short period of time, he heard that his son had been wounded uh, in a battle in the Civil War. And, and these words are powerful to speak to our temptation to despair and forget about the good news of the gospel of peace in the midst of turmoil. And uh, the hymn goes like this. I think it's familiar to you. You've probably heard it a number of times. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carol play. And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then farther on in the carol, it talks about the circumstances around the Civil War. Then from each black, accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south. The carols drowned. And with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There's no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail. The right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. You see, God's not dead. Messiah has come. There's a new day dawning when everything will be made, every wrong will be made right. God's not dead here in Canada or in Toronto, in the streets of Toronto, or in the U.S. post-election, or in China, where, the, where, where believers at this very day, on this very day, are being thrown into jail with a renewed persecution from the government. God's not dead in Nigeria, where believers are being rounded up, kidnapped, and murdered. And He's not dead in any one of our lives in the midst of the pandemic, or in the midst of fear 
and insecurity and lack of control. He lives. And he's still a sovereign of the universe. And his gospel is still the good news in the midst of turmoil and unrest. And God is at work moving all that for his glory and for our peace. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words of encouragement from the angels who proclaimed your gospel and your good news of peace. And we pray now, O oh Lord, in your mercy, you would help us to appropriate that peace by faith. Father, whether we're here this morning and have heard this message of your good news for the first time, or whether it's dawned on our hearts and minds for the first time, or whether we've heard it a number of times, God, and we just need to, at noon afresh, trust you for tomorrow. So God, grant us that grace and that help and your peace in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. And um, what time is it? Oh, I'm three minutes early. So um, you're free to go. And please remember uh, to keep your masks on in the tent. And uh, there's food and goodies and hot chocolate and stuff out there. Feel free.